Chapter 40 Absolutely Batshit Crazy There is a tendency to separate people into the good and the bad. Ted Gunderson defies such easy categorization. Crazy, self-serving, lost in a funhouse of his own contrivance, he is responsible for further blurring the line between fact and fiction, given that that line is blurry to begin with, rather than adding any clarity to the case. He had been the special agent in charge of the Los Angeles office of the FBI. The scuttlebutt is that he was being considered for the post of FBI director, but it was given to Judge William H. Webster. Gunderson took early retirement from the FBI in March 1979 and started Ted L. Gunderson and Associates, a private detective agency. Jeffrey McDonald was one of his first clients. I tried to talk to Gunderson in 2011, just before he died, a string of non-working numbers, and then I finally reached him, after a fashion. In an era of bad telephone connections, this was among the very worst I've experienced. I could barely hear Gunderson, but he somehow conveyed through the static that he was dying and that he was trapped in various conspiracies too terrible to describe. He kept saying over and over and over again, Terrible. It's terrible. Terrible, terrible, terrible. I had planned to meet him in L.A., but by my next trip out there, he was already dead. It was almost as if he had disappeared. After the decision by the Supreme Court that sent McDonald back to prison, Siegel finally quit. He had been replaced by Brian O'Neill, who inherited the investigative duo of Gunderson and Prince Beasley. I asked O'Neill about Gunderson. You inherited Gunderson from Siegel? Brian O'Neill. Oh, yes. He was a good guy, but he was nuts. Really nuts. I went to a Catholic law school, so I can say this. Guys with Irish names who go to Catholic law schools, half of them become FBI agents. One of my classmates told me the following is the FBI culture. If you're ambitious, you become a supervisor. If you're a supervisor, you never investigate anymore. And if you don't investigate anymore, you really don't know what you're looking for or what you're doing when you're investigating. Gunderson was one of those guys. A decent guy, a well-intended guy who really loved Jeff and really thought that Jeff got screwed, but he was a loose cannon. Ted had come to believe somehow that Helena and the gang she ran with were part of a satanic cult. Satanic cult? Yes, he was jumping up and down about it. I told him that I believed that she was involved with the murders, but I also told him it doesn't matter whether they're part of a satanic cult or not. There is no way that we can prove this frickin' thing. It doesn't advance our case. And he went absolutely batshit crazy. He was screaming that there was a conspiracy against Jeff at the highest levels of government, and I, Brian O'Neill, was part of it, or assisting it, because I refused to accept this claim. And Beasley went along with this? He was dying. He wasn't in bed dying, but he was really on his last legs. He was a good guy, too. Ted had found him, and Beasley was a very nice kind of a country guy who was in love with Ted. Ted looked like an FBI agent in the movies. In fact, I think he had worked as a consultant to the movies. Wore great suits, had a nice head of white hair, spoke very authoritatively on damn near everything. Sometimes with accurate information, sometimes not. And he quite impressed Beasley. Prince Beasley was a very good guy. I think he did something good in the case. He was the first guy to get to Helena on behalf of Jeff, back before the trial. And Beasley and Gunderson were trying to prove a conspiracy from early on? Yes. They wanted to prove that there was a conspiracy between the military and these druggies. And once we proved that, which would have taken a lifetime, we would thereby have come upon information which would aid Jeff's defense. Gunderson was a big believer that the government had mobilized to get McDonald. He's Oliver Stone. Yes, but Ted was not a bad guy. He was just so difficult. If you weren't with Ted, you were part of something else. He was always kind of accusatory. And then he'd back off and be nice, and then he'd lose it again. But he really had Jeff's best interest at heart. I have no doubt about that. That was why he was unreliable. 
He was just so willing to accept any possible explanation. I was confident we would never prove anything if we had to prove a conspiracy, prove the DEA or the FBI was in league with somebody. I hope he was wrong. I hope our failure to chase that wasn't... Well, who knows? I hoped there was nothing there, and I didn't think we could prove it, even if it was there. Satanic cults or conspiracy? Both. That was what Gunderson tried to prove. I think he got it from Helena. Helena was nutty enough that she could have told him that, and nutty enough to be involved. I try to imagine what happened. It is so many years after the fact. Beasley and Gunderson are dead. But they left a paper trail, as well as a video, as a record of their efforts. Gunderson was hired by Siegel shortly after McDonald's conviction and turned his attention to Helena Stokely. He hired Prince Beasley to find and manage Stokely for him. It's a road trip movie. Prince Beasley summarized some of this early history in a report entitled My First Encounter with Ted Gunderson. It could be an elementary school essay like Why I Like Firemen or My First Trip to the Bank. It is typed on what looks like an old portable and filled with Xings out, misspellings, dyslexic letter reversals, and the like. The letter resembles the investigation as a whole. An admixture of the obscure, the lucid, the probative, the manipulative, and the insane. And it is a prelude to the several trips to California described by Beasley in this and several subsequent documents. Several scenes stay in the mind. Gunderson and Beasley prowling the drug jungle, in Beasley's words, of Greenville, South Carolina, trying to find either Stokely or Ernie Davis, or both. At first, they fail. Beasley and Gunderson, crammed into a phone booth, speak to Stokely at an undisclosed location, but she won't meet them. Gunderson returns to Los Angeles. Gunderson engaged two psychics, spelled P-H-Y-C-H-I-C-S, Beasley provides few details. Did the psychics employ articles of clothing? Were they like bloodhounds? The psychics go to the shoe store where Stokely works. They go to her home. She is living with Clarence, her older brother. And then by serendipity, or pure chance, they finally find Stokely shopping for a nurse's uniform in a J.C. Penney. A phone call with Gunderson in Los Angeles is arranged. Offers of money. Stokely was adamant that she had never accepted payment in exchange for her cooperation. Various subterfuges designed by Gunderson to get her to cooperate. Already I feel there is a tension between Gunderson and Beasley. Beasley truly likes Helena. There are limits to what he will say to her, particularly to what he will promise. Gunderson, on the other hand, was willing to say or do anything. During one of our conversations... I mentioned the amount of money that Ted told me to tell her. Elena just laughed and said, Let's drop this. She said the reason she was going to talk was that she knew Jeff was not guilty. Gunderson seems conniving. Gunderson told me that it was very important that I got Helena to talk. I asked him if he thought she was a fool, that she was not going to talk her way into prison. He stated to me that if he made it worthwhile, she might. I asked him what he meant, and he told me to offer her any amount, that money was no object. I asked him how much was no object, and he stated 25000 to $50,000 or even higher, that Jeff's life was at stake, and we had to clear this case up to offer her anything as long as we got what we wanted. If the machinations of the prosecutors during the 1979 trial were terrible, this was arguably worse and had its own sad outcome. Gunderson summoned the two of them to California. Before they left, Beasley interviewed Stokely at the Bordeaux Motor Inn in Fayetteville, the one next to the miniature Eiffel Tower. Helena stated that Dr. MacDonald was indirectly involved with the deaths of his family. She stated that he had cut several people off and refused to give them treatment for drug addiction, and that he would turn them into their commanding officers and this would cause them problems. She stated that she was into black witchcraft, and at that time the black cult was very active in Fayetteville, and they would stop at nothing. She stated that she was still a witch, 
and that some people could see stars in her eyes, and that black cats shied away from her. Elena stated that she was in the McDonald home on the night of the killings, and further stated that the little rocking horse had a broken spring on it, that until this day, every time she sees a rocking horse or an ice pick, she just about flips out. On October 24th, 1980, Beasley and Stokely flew to California. While in the air, Stokely once again admitted that she was in the McDonald house on the night of the murders. She periodically dozed off during the flight and would wake up with a scared look in her eyes. Each time Beasley asked what was the matter, and she stated that she could not get the McDonald murders off her mind. And more details were offered up voluntarily. It is hard to know what to make of any of it. Stokely had spent a day looking at photographs with Siegel, Zilio, Underhill, and others. Was it possible now to distinguish her genuine memories from what had been enhanced or changed by repeated conversations with attorneys, prosecutors, FBI agents, detectives, acquaintances? She began to cry, and Beasley told her if it would make her feel any better to go ahead and talk about it. She then started repeating the words, Rocking horse, rocking horse. She said she was in one of the children's rooms, but she didn't know which one, and there was a rocking horse there. Beasley asked her if she tried to ride it, and she stated she didn't try to ride it, but that she sort of squatted down on it, but it didn't work because a spring was broken on it. She repeated over and over again about the rocking horse and hid her face, saying that she just couldn't talk about it. She also told Beasley that she was at the couch where McDonald was sleeping, and she did have a candle, and the candle was lit. Beasley asked her who was with her, and she was reluctant to say, although she did mention Greg Mitchell and a person known as Wizard. In Los Angeles, she was given a lie detector test by Scott Marrow. Marrow had provided two sets of questions. The first set, he called it Phase 1, concerned her possible involvement in the murder of the McDonald family. Were you in the house when the murders were committed? Yes. Did you see any of the cult members hitting or stabbing Dr. McDonald or his family? Yes. On February 17, 1970, were you holding a candle in the McDonald house while Dr. Jeffrey McDonald was being beaten? On February 17, 1970, did you back into the McDonald toy rocking horse? Yes. Marrow concluded that there was no deception in Stokely's responses. Stokely specifically was asked and denied that she saw the picture of the hobby horse in the newspaper. She could have heard about it from someone who had seen the picture in the newspaper, or she could have been shown a photograph, but still it suggested something other than confabulation. Like Brizantine, nearly a decade earlier, Marrow concluded that she believed in her mind that she was there. After a careful evaluation of all test questions, including relevant, irrelevant, and control questions, it was the examiner's opinion that Ms. Foster, Stokely's alias, answered all the preceding relevant questions truthfully during this first phase of the polygraph examination. And then phase two. Marrow continued with a new line of questioning. Did Stokely know that the McDonald family was going to be murdered that night? No. Was there a pre-existing plan to kill the family? No. Were cult members present during the murders? No. Was Wizard with you in the McDonald house during the February 17, 1970 murders? No. Stokely didn't perform as well on the Phase 2 questions. The test showed deception. But what did that mean? It is part of the perplexing nature of lie detector examinations that a deceptive answer can mean anything. When she answered no to the question of whether there was a pre-existing plot to kill the McDonald family, does that mean there was one? Chapter 41 The Sound of Music Around December 4, 1980, Beasley and Stokely flew back to Los Angeles. Gunderson asked for another series of statements. He didn't know where to stop. He saw conspiracies everywhere. 
and he wanted Stokely to support his various cockamamie theories. Oddly, it is Gunderson who convinced me that Stokely might have been in that house that evening. Why? Because she resisted his attempts to influence and ultimately subvert her story. Robert Brizantine, the polygraph expert, had told me that he believed she was highly suggestible. This made me believe the opposite. Stokely's story might have been hopelessly confused, but it was her story and her confusion. Gunderson offered her immunity, but it was pretty clear that he didn't have the authority to make such an offer. And once more, both Stokely and Beasley knew this. Beasley wrote, Ted told her that he would give her immunity if she would tell all that she knew about the case. I asked him if this was legal for him to promise this. He stated that he would not add it into the statement. Gunderson tried to get her to name high-ranking army officials, but she was adamant in insisting there was no cover-up, other than the possibility that the CID did a sloppy investigation. Stokely was not interested in conspiracies. Gunderson was. After two days of this, Stokely insisted that she had to go home. She had had enough, and this is where it starts to get really crazy. You can feel the underlying tone. Gunderson's relentless pressure, Stokely's annoyance, and Beasley's reluctant acquiescence. Beasley was the good cop, Gunderson the bad cop. Except here, it seems more than a strategy. Stokely was sent in by Gunderson for yet one more lie detector test with Marrow. And just before the test began, Gunderson started pressuring her again about a possible conspiracy involving the army. Again, she told him that there was no such conspiracy. There is something both horrible and comical about this lunatic ex-FBI agent trying to decide whether Stokely herself was a lunatic. Beasley writes, About 15 minutes before the test was administered, Ted told Helena that she would only get about 30 or 40 years in prison for the part she played in the McDonald case. Helena looked as though she went into a trance of some sort. She muttered to herself that she just could not go to prison. She stated that she was trying to clear things up and submitted to all that was required of her, and that was the thanks she was getting. About 30 minutes later, Mr. Merrow returned to the room where me and Ted was. He made the statement, What in the hell did you say to Helena prior to the test? I told him what Ted had told her about her going to prison. At the time, Mr. Merrow stated that from the report that he had just gotten and from the questions that he had asked her, it was his opinion that she was nowhere near the McDonald home on the night of the murders, nor did she know anyone that was involved. At the time, Ted went to where Helena was at and tried to calm her down, but to no avail. Mr. Merrow stated that he would not give her another test at this time, but that he would rule the test just given as being inconclusive. However, he did say that the first test given Helena on the first trip to California was conclusive. Afterward, Gunderson dragged Stokely off for one more evaluation, to Rex Bieber, a lawyer, clinical psychologist, and an assistant professor of medicine at UCLA. Bieber gave her the usual battery of psychological tests, Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, MMPI, the Thematic A Perception Test, T.A.T., and then interviewed her about the events of February 16, 17, 1970. It was a five-hour examination. Bieber's notes are extensive, ten single-spaced, typewritten pages filled with Stokely's vivid memories. It was a convincing list of details, an off-air television left on in the McDonald living room, an open book resting on McDonald's chest, his glasses on the floor a child covered in blood. Bieber, referring to himself in the third person, writes, Stokely tells Bieber, From car to house I remember, and fumbling at the door, someone saying to be quiet or you'll make the dog bark, going through kitchen, finding Dr. Mack, television on but off the air, seeing his glasses lying on the floor. Just then all I can remember is that I was peeking on mescaline, Somewhere after this, I was seeing blood. In one room, I panicked and screamed. Thought I headed outside through utility room, 
went back in, everything was out of control. All I knew was we had to get out of there. Went out utility room, around house, to the car. I don't know who was with me. Overwhelmed, made a U-turn, passed the information center, then don't remember the ride. Apparently stopped at Dunkin' Donuts, washed up, was seen there. Pulling into driveway in blue Mustang, guy was holding a Dunkin' Donuts box. Stokely knows who this was. Got out of car, light rain. Bieber asks, can you remember the murders themselves? Stokely responds, no, I didn't see any. I saw Dr. Mac struck with fists and it drew blood. When I saw a child in bedroom, I was already covered in blood from what I could see from a dimly lit hallway. There was no rise and fall of her chest, and judging by the amount of blood, she was dead. I wouldn't go in. There was a small doll on the floor that I wanted to go in and pick up. You know how children sleep. She was in a position that looked like she was sleeping, but you knew she wasn't, so I wouldn't go in the room. McDonald supposedly pulled a paring knife out of her throat. When I left, there wasn't a paring knife in her throat. Yet one time when I heard her in there, when she was calling out to him, Jeff, why are you letting them do this to me? Her voice was in a gurgle, as if she had been stabbed in the throat already, like someone that had something in their throat and were trying to talk. Dr. Mack was in the living room. He had fallen asleep watching television or reading a book. He had a book on his chest, turned upside down. He was on the couch. She was in the back bedroom, one child with her. Not sure which one. Bieber asks, Anything significant that I haven't asked about? Stokely responds, I don't think so. I don't blame anyone for what's happened to me. I used to, but not now. Bieber concluded that while details had changed in Stokely's retellings of her story, the crux, that she was present during the murders, had not it is my opinion that notwithstanding the internal inconsistencies in Helena Stokely's various statements regarding the McDonald murders, she has been relatively constant in her contention that she was present during the offense and that the offense was carried out by persons other than the defendant, Dr. Jeffrey R. McDonald. It is possible, and consistent with psychological scientific thinking, that this profound event and its memory could remain intact while other factors would blur the accuracy of various details and event sequences. I called Bieber. I assume that she told you that she had been a witness to the murders in Fayetteville in 1970. My recollection is that she said she was there. Did you have a feeling about whether she had actually been there, or that she believed that she was there? I certainly had the sense that she believed that she was there. I did not feel like this was a bad faith report or a false report made for ulterior motives. There are some kinds of mental disorders that simply are disabling to someone in the sense of being able to tell the truth, and I had a strong sense that she was capable of telling the truth, and she certainly was capable of some recall, however rudimentary. The one thing that made her story have an element of believability to it, to me, was the story that she provided made sense to me. I've never been able to understand the prosecution's theory of why MacDonald perpetrated these homicides. It's a very unusual crime, unlike any crime I've ever been involved with. And I've been involved with some of the strangest crimes. It doesn't mean it's not possible. He could be the rare case, but having said that, it just didn't make a lot of sense. Why? People who have severe mental illnesses commit bizarre crimes because they have some bizarre delusion. I'm going to give you an example. I once examined a suspect who suffered from a relatively rare subspecies of schizophrenia who had never committed a crime in his life. He noticed that in his street address, 5154, if you added up the 5 and 1, you got 6, and if you added up the 5 and the 4, you got 9. So that meant that his address, from his point of view, was secretly 69, and 69, he thought, was a sign of the devil. He knew that he wasn't the devil, because he was a very religious and observant person. So if the house had the sign of the devil on it, and he was not the devil, 
therefore his wife and children were the devil, at which point he proceeded to kill them all. Jeffrey MacDonald, by any measure I know, does not suffer from any severe mental illness, and certainly not the kinds of mental illnesses that would produce delusions consistent with a bizarre crime. That knocked him out of one whole series of explanations of his involvement. So now we're left with people who aren't mentally ill and why they commit crimes. A large cluster of those, especially family homicides, are people who commit the crime in the heat of passion in response to some specific dispute or argument and of some momentous quality. I've seen no evidence of that here, and more importantly, even in those instances, the person that's killed is the wife, not the wife and the children. Does that make you think he's innocent? I'll put on my other hat now. You know I'm also an attorney. What's frightening about cases like this, and I say this as somebody who doesn't have a strong sense about whether he's guilty or innocent, is that it ignores the principle of law that will not convict a person of a crime if there is any reasonable doubt. It's inconceivable to me that someone doesn't have a reasonable doubt when the evidence is as thin as this, and so completely lacking in some kind of explanation and motive. To me, this case represents a failure of the system. It happens more often in the most horrible cases. In a jury's passion that somebody be punished, they often ignore the reasonable doubt standard to ensure that somebody is punished, rather than live with the feeling that such a horror went unpunished. People like closure. There is a concept in social psychology called the just world hypothesis. People want to believe it's a just world, so horrible, horrible crimes must be punished. The way the jury sees it, either I convict this man or woman, or this horrible crime goes unpunished. A jury is not given the choice of saying, I want you to go out and for one year forget about Jeffrey McDonald and work harder at finding somebody else, and then come back to me after that year. They're only permitted to say he's guilty or to set him free. That's a very painful choice for ordinary good people who see the evidence of a tragedy beyond measure in the most inflammatory presentation. But there was somebody else, Elena Stokely. The prosecutors argued that she was lying or confabulating or was in such an addled state that it was meaningless even to talk about what she knew or didn't know. There's something humorous about that argument. Because a day doesn't go by in the United States where a prosecution does not rest its case on the statements of a cooperating co-conspirator who has an indisputable history of felonies, lies, and perjuries. Their standard for credibility, for integrity and honesty, could not be lower. And yet all of a sudden these prosecutors require that a defense witness be held up to a high standard of psychological health. I know why they did it. They did it because they decided McDonald's guilty. Having decided he is guilty, the end of having a guilty person in prison justifies the means. Do you think it was ever possible to figure out whether she was telling the truth? The best way to know if someone is telling the truth is to have a description of the crime so complete, so detailed, that there is no way the accuracy could have been achieved without personal knowledge. She gave us an extraordinary amount of detail. She described the doll on the floor, the location of McDonald's glasses, the book on his chest, turned over. These are not trivial details. These would be details that would only be known, if accurate, to somebody in the house. That's the $64,000 question. She gave details about this rocking horse, which was in one of the children's bedrooms. Then it was pointed out that the picture of the rocking horse was published in the Fayetteville Observer the day after the murders, so that may mean nothing. And it goes on and on and on. Claim and counterclaim. Did she see something? Did she hear about it from the newspapers? You don't know what's real, what's confabulated. And then often there are contradictions and holes in her memory. That's often the case. Let me give an example. Have you seen The Sound of Music? Yes, of course. Just tell me in a few sentences what the story is. Do I even remember the story? I remember Julie Andrews. I remember the Trapp family singers. I have a very bad memory for plot. I remember the Nazis. The Nazis figured into it. Okay, have I failed this one? No, 
Go on, say what you can remember. I remember Christopher Plummer. He referred to it as the sound of mucus because he hated it, even though he starred in it. I want to hear your memory of the movie, not your memory of... I remember the nun singing Climb Every Mountain. I remember Julie Andrews running in the field. Are you sure you saw it? I can even remember where I saw it. Come on now, you can't even remember what the story is about. No, but I can remember where I saw it. I don't believe that you've ever seen the film. Really? If you saw the film, you would know what the story's about. How could you see one of the most famous films made in the 20th century and not know the storyline? Is there something wrong with you? There is something wrong with me. You have no idea. The point I want to suggest to you is this film, which you saw in Technicolor under optimal viewing circumstances, probably without any stress, without bad lighting conditions or any other problems, that your memory of it is just a bunch of fragments. Indeed it is. And that's exactly what her memory was of this homicide. The little snapshots are not the same snapshots, but it was a snapshot here and a snapshot there. And if I would have asked you when Julie Andrews is on the mountain and she is singing The Sound of Music, the big theme song, what color is her skirt? What's growing in the field? You might give an answer that would be your best recollection, and you probably would be wrong, half of the time or more. But if I said to you that because you were wrong, because you couldn't remember this or you misremembered it, that you didn't see the film, you'd say that's ridiculous. There is a big difference between the ability to remember whether you saw a film and to remember the content of that film with any level of detail. That's exactly what crimes are like. It's very easy to remember that you were at the scene of a homicide. A person could be an extremely impaired human being and can have all kinds of problems with the circumstances of viewing that event, and that basic fact would remain. In your experience, given the kinds of details that she provided, you have to really know what that crime scene looked like. Why would there be a book on Jeffrey McDonald's chest? I mean, he talked about, for example, the fact that he was reading a Mickey Spillane mystery novel, Kiss Me Deadly. It's another oddity of memory that what people remember is often not correlated with the significance of the thing. People will be involved in an incident and will remember it with very good detail, something that you think is a trifling detail, and not remember something else that's very important. And no one knows why that's true. But if when the police enter the house, there is a book on his chest or a book on the floor nearby, that's not a trivial concurrence of memory. The simple fact is that with all of this information, in the end, no one is going to know whether she was there or not. Certainly nothing you're going to find out at this late date. The system always makes its decisions in the face of informational uncertainty. So the master question is, how much uncertainty is too much? On the way to the crime scene, one of the MPs saw a woman wearing, as he described it, a wide-brimmed hat. There was a light rain. She was standing in a deserted part of the base, but a couple of blocks from the McDonald residence. The MP was answering an emergency call. He was going to the scene of the crime and didn't stop, but when McDonald provided a description of these four assailants, one of the people he described was a woman with a floppy hat. What to make of it? What to make of it requires that you know what to make of it, but it certainly is the stuff on which reasonable doubt is built. Is she the only woman in the world who wears a floppy hat? Of course not. Whoever made that floppy hat sold them by the millions, probably. But it contributes to how much fog is in the room when the jury has to decide on guilt or innocence. If you think of each piece of exculpatory evidence as a bit of fog, at some point there's enough fog in the room that twelve good people say, I really can't make out who's in here anymore. After her evaluation, Stokely once again asked Gunderson if she could leave. This time she was more successful. Beasley writes, Elena stated over and over that she wanted to return home, but Ted did not let her come. He was still trying to pry information out of her. We did not have return tickets to North Carolina, so the both of us was at his mercy. 
Helene had told him that if he did not send her back, she was going to hitchhike back to North Carolina. I then told Ted that the best thing for him to do was to send her back because he may be violating her rights. At this, Ted took the both of us to the Los Angeles airport and purchased tickets for the return flight the next day. He left us there alone to find our way the best we could, saying that he had to meet someone, and also the remark was made that now that he had everything he needed, he couldn't care less if she was run over by a truck. Chapter 42 A Satanic Cult You would think that would be the end of it, Beasley and Stokely at LAX on their way back east. But there was one more trip to Los Angeles. On May 21, 1982, Gunderson persuaded Helena Stokely to tell her story on camera in an interview for 60 minutes. The interview footage looks like it was shot on 16mm film, then transferred to video and copied hundreds of times. The image has a nacreous quality. Who knows what it looked like then? The screen goes to white, and then an image pops up, a wide shot of a hotel room. The production slate is sitting on the cushion of a floral-patterned wing-backed chair, as if the slate is to be interviewed. The screen goes to white again, and up pops Helena Stokely, eight months pregnant in a purple plaid frock. The interview begins with a voiceover, the voice of Ted Gunderson, and there is Stokely, shaking her head back and forth, for reasons we will never know. Gunderson interrupts constantly, but when Stokely is allowed to talk, a powerful story emerges filled with endless detail. Ted Gunderson. Elena, these murders, the McDonald murders, occurred the early morning hours of February 17, 1970. Since that time, a number of people have said that you talked to them and advised, in some instances, you were there. Others said that you said you were there, but you are not sure, in other instances, you advised that you were not there. And then, in October and December of 1980, you gave Mr. Beasley and me a statement wherein you advised that you were definitely there. Can you tell us why you've changed your mind through these last 12 years so many times? Elena Stokely. Yes, sir. Because at the time of the murders, I was involved with the satanic cult. Since then, I have been contacted. I'm now pregnant. Anyone who knows anything about witchcraft knows the firstborn child can be sacrificed and will be. I have been threatened. Threats have been made on me, my family, and everyone else. So you've changed your story. I haven't changed my story. I'm only dropping names. Stokely goes on to describe how she became a member of a cult. Although she was a practicing Roman Catholic, she became interested in white witchcraft. Gunderson asks her about the difference between white and black witchcraft. Stokely's answer, one is for benevolent purposes, the other is for curses and things such as that. He asks about a motivation for the crimes. Stokely told him that they were trying to punish MacDonald for his treatment of drug addicts, that they were going to teach him a lesson. Gunderson then asks Stokely to describe how she was dressed and the details of what she saw in the house on the night of the murders. Where did the group meet immediately prior to going to the McDonald house the night of the murders? Early in the evening we met at Rowan Street Park and then at 1108 Clark Street. I had a floppy hat that I used to wear all the time. I had on boots that night. And before we left, before I dropped the mescaline, I was already smoking marijuana and everything. And as a joke, I put on the blonde wig that belonged to my roommate. I was wearing a black vest, and it was a combination of pants and skirt. Elena, tell us what happened from the time you entered the house that night. Up to this point, Gunderson asked a question, and Stokely briefly answered. Here she provides an uninterrupted narrative. I entered the house with another member of the cult. We had to struggle with the door, which is the reason I lit the candle to begin with. We went in. There were three members in there already, talking to Dr. MacDonald. I thought they were simply asking for drugs or something like that. As it turns out, it turned into violence. I said, leave him alone. 
and they asked him to go to the telephone and call someone and see if he could get a prescription or to get the drugs themselves. He said he would, he tried to, and we realized he was calling the MPs. That's when they forced him back to the couch. Someone knocked him unconscious. After that, I went into the back bedroom. That's when I saw two other members in there. Colette was struggling with them. There was a child laying on the bed next to her that I presumed was asleep. She had already been beaten several times and was calling out to her husband to help her. I presume she was still unconscious or something like that, but she was bleeding profusely by that time. It was all over the bed. It was on the child, so I don't know if the child was dead or not. I said, let's leave her alone, that this was unnecessary and someone called me a do-gooder or something. I'd already been called a goody-goody two-shoes in the front living room, and I left the room. There was a hobby horse, like a rocking horse. I backed up against it, but the spring was broken, so I moved away from it. In the other room, there was a child's toy. There were children's books, things like that. I don't know whose bedroom it was, but there was another child in there asleep. There was no blood in there or anything at that time. I went back out front, and by that time, Dr. McDonald had regained consciousness, and someone was in there beating him. I know who it was, but like I said... I'm not going to give names or anything because of my own safety and the safety of my family and the threat of personal danger. Where did you go after you went into the living room? At that time the phone rang. Everyone was standing around and said who should answer it, and I was designated as the person to go answer the phone. I picked it up and someone asked for Dr. McDonald. Well, by that time I was pretty high on mescaline and I just giggled and said he wasn't there or something like that. They accepted that, and that was it, so I hung up the phone. The phone rang? On August 17th, 1979, the day that Helena Stokely was on the stand in Raleigh, a man named Jimmy Fryer provided the FBI with an affidavit about his call to the McDonald House on the night of the murders. He had contacted Wade Smith shortly before going to the FBI. According to Fryer, he was trying to call someone else, a different Dr. McDonald. Did he make the phone call? We'll never know. The affidavit goes into considerable detail. A Greyhound bus station in Fayetteville, the Green Lantern Bar, an old hotel in the Haymount area, about one half to one mile from the Green Lantern Bar. Fryer was an AWOL soldier who had been treated by a psychiatrist, Dr. Richard McDonald, at Walter Reed Hospital. Fryer then hung up, waited a few minutes, and then called Womack Army Hospital again. During the second call, he represented himself as being a doctor and stated an emergency existed, and that he needed to get in touch with Dr. McDonald. Womack Army Hospital then gave him the residence number of Dr. McDonald. Fryer then called the operator at the same pay telephone and told her that he had just lost 10 cents in the telephone and requested her to dial the telephone number which Womack Army Hospital had given him. The operator dialed the number and a female answered the telephone. Fryer asked for Dr. McDonald and the female broke into hysterical laughter. Fryer asked again to speak to McDonald and this same female continued to laugh. The only words which Fryer could recall being said were, Hang up the goddamn phone. Who knows what the Fryer story means? Who knows what Siegel told Stokely? Or Murtaugh? Or Blackburn? Or Gunderson? Or Beasley? Who knows what she would have said if properly deposed in early 1970? Could her stories all be confabulated? constructed out of the bits and pieces that Stokely was told by investigators, prosecutors, defense attorneys? Or was there something here? Rex Bieber would say that the richness of detail supplied by Stokely was more than a trivial concurrence of memory. Perhaps not proof that she was there, but something more than a recitation of information she had heard from others. And what about that other phone call, the one that McDonald was forced to make? Did that ever happen? McDonald certainly never mentioned it. 
I went back into the bedroom again, and this one person, by that time, for some reason, the one child had been moved to the other bedroom that was laying with Colette at the time. When I went back, Colette appeared to be either asleep or unconscious, and I suggested we leave, and that was it. Tell us about when you left the house. Well, previously, when we entered the house, there was a dog in the yard, and I was raised in an army environment around guard dogs and things like that. It was a German shepherd. I told them to be quiet when we went in, because I went over there and I tried to pet the dog. It didn't try to bite or anything. Going out, I told them again to be quiet, so when we went out, I still had the candle in my hand. Didn't everyone get out of the house then, at the same time? I'm not sure. I didn't check. I just wanted to get out. Where did you park the car? How many buildings down from the McDonald residence did you park the getaway car? One car was parked on the road. The other one was parked in a parking lot. They had parking lots with about five spaces each to them, and we were in one of them. Joe Worshba, the 60 Minutes producer, took over the questioning. Joe Worshba. When you left, where did you go? We stopped at Dunkin' Donuts and picked up several other people there who were not involved in the murders. I went inside to the restroom, washed my hands, and came back out, and we left. Did you have blood on you? I don't know. When you left, where did you go? Back to 1108 Clark Street. Which is? My residence at the time. Who were you living with at the time? I was living with two other females, Kathy Smith and Diane. Her married name is Cazares. What time did you arrive back at your house? About 4.30, 5 o'clock. How did you get there? In the Blue Mustang. Did somebody drop you off? The Blue Mustang pulled in. We were listening to the radio. I took the box of donuts out and walked in the house and my two roommates were in there, painting on the wall. Stokely's description was very close to Posey's account given at the Article 32 and in his various depositions during the reinvestigation. On March 19 and 22, 1971, Posey had given a statement to Richard Mahone of the CID. I heard a car skid into Helen's driveway, and I also heard some giggling and laughing. I went to my front door to see what was going on, and I saw Stokely get out of a blue Mach 1 Mustang and enter her apartment between 3 and 4.30 a.m. I had seen the Mustang at Helen's house several times before 17 February 1970, but I don't think I saw that car again after that day. I also saw one of the girls that Helen lived with painting the bathroom walls. I woke up my wife to see because... I thought it was kind of unusual, kind of weird, to be painting at that time of the morning. Painting at 4 a.m.? Gunderson asked Stokely what happened to the group after the murders. Well, most of the people in the group decided it was in our best interest to disband temporarily. And? Some of us went to other states, others feigned innocence. Joe Worshba. How about the day after the murders? Were you stopped? Very early the next morning, the 18th, Detective Beasley stopped me and several other people in the band. In the cult that were involved in the murders? Yes, sir. And what happened then? At the time, I was an informant for Mr. Beasley. He started to get out of the car, and the people in the car had weapons and such. They started to approach him as if to assault him in some way. And I turned around to them and said, It's all right, I can talk to him for a minute. And they got back in the car. Gunderson turned his attention to Colette's jewelry box. MacDonald had long claimed that two rings were missing. And you knew the location of the jewelry box, where the jewelry was located? It was in the master bedroom. And where in the master bedroom? On the high dresser. You told us on the low dresser. No, there was one dresser that was just a chest of drawers, but as far as the dressers go, there was one nightstand, too. So, you know, if you want to be particular, it was the low dresser. A big issue in the case is the fact that you said that the hobby horse was broken. 
The prosecution claims that you saw a picture in the newspaper several days after, and therefore you knew it from looking at the newspaper. But actually, the only people that knew that the hobby horse was broken were the McDonald's themselves. Did you see this picture in the newspaper? I never knew anything about the hobby horse again until 1979. You knew that night that the spring was broken? The night of the murders, yes, but it was never mentioned again until 1979 at the trial in Raleigh. Indeed, it was the one detail that Stokely mentioned on the stand. More questions by Joe Wershba. The night of the murders, were all the members of the cult high on drugs? Very much so. Aren't you concerned about being on television with this interview? Not at this time anymore, since I've been off of drugs for over three years now. I feel that what needs to be done is to have the truth brought out once and for all, and to have people who have been prosecuted in this case and indicted and all that freed once and for all. So, your motivation is out of conscience for both McDonald and for your personal safety and the safety of your future child? Yes, it is. After their third trip back from Los Angeles, Beasley visited Helena on December 30, 1982, at her room in the Seneca Gardens Apartments in Walhalla, South Carolina. It was their last meeting. She stated that the only thing she had to live for now was her son, that she intended to live in the Walhalla area until her husband was near parole, and then she was leaving the area for parts unknown, so he could not find her. I told her to continue to think along this line, and I thought she would come out okay. I have been to South Carolina many times, and I have never found Helena to be on drugs or anything else. The day that I took her home from the hospital with her son, she seemed to be in good health and spirits, and made no complaints about being sick. In fact, she was in a joyful mood that she had her son back home. Two weeks later, on January 14, 1983, Elena Stokely was found dead in her apartment. Her baby was found at her side, severely dehydrated but alive. Beasley suspected foul play. He went back and spoke to Ursley Fitzgerald, a neighbor who lived in number 26 and who had come to know Helena well when she lived there. Fitzgerald told Beasley that Helena was a very scared person most all the time, always seemed to be looking over her shoulder. She would not trust many people. Since she was the only possible witness, as described in the police report in the McDonald trial, the South Carolina authorities performed an autopsy. It determined that there had been no foul play. Stokely had died from a combination of pneumonia and liver disease. Various swabs and tissue samples were forwarded to the FBI labs in Washington. She was still a possible witness in the McDonald case, albeit a silent one. Beasley returned to Fayetteville, eventually terminating his involvement in the investigation of McDonald's case altogether. He was still protective of Helena years after her death, and her treatment at the hands of his former hero and partner, Ted Gunderson, caused him to undergo a conversion. He decided that Jeffrey McDonald was guilty, as if any investigation involving Gunderson would surely be on the wrong side. I can't prove it. I didn't see him kill them, but all the evidence and all the circumstances around the investigations by both the government and the defense points that way said Prince Beasley, a retired narcotics officer. He said he changed his mind about Dr. MacDonald when he became convinced that the defense's key witness, Helena Stokely, was manipulated by investigators working for the convicted physician. Mr. Beasley's reversal was a complete surprise to Mr. Gunderson, who said in a telephone conversation from his Los Angeles office that he believes Mr. Beasley or his family must have been threatened. Mr. Beasley said he was not threatened. I agree with Prince Beasley that Helena Stokely was manipulated. Manipulated by the defense, manipulated by the prosecution, manipulated by lawyers and investigators on both sides of the fence. That fact is unfortunate. It has thrown more than one monkey wrench into this case. 
but I do not agree that it proves McDonald's guilt or that Helena was not somehow speaking the truth. In February 1970, a group of inexperienced military policemen and investigators failed to protect the crime scene at 544 Castle Drive. As a result, the integrity of the physical evidence was compromised. And then, from 1980 to 1982, Ted Gunderson, with the help of Prince Beasley, essentially compromised the value of Stokely's and other witnesses' testimony. Gunderson coerced, bribed, and threatened Stokely, contaminating her as a witness. Although he was trying to help, his errors worked against Jeffrey MacDonald. Michael Malley told me that he was appalled by Gunderson's techniques. Gunderson was fired and replaced, but it might have been too late. I had wanted to talk to Ted Gunderson, but I had also been afraid of talking to him. How crazy was he? Stokely died in 1983. Beasley died in 1996. Gunderson outlived them both and went on to be a fixture in the online world of conspiracy theorists and skeptics, his website became a compendium of Looney Tune concerns. 9-11 was an inside job, the healing power of colloidal silver. For Gunderson, the entire world, as we experience it, was a lie, waiting to be unmasked. For years, Gunderson appeared on radio and TV talk shows and on DVDs, often arguing, among many other things, that Jeffrey MacDonald was innocent of all charges, a victim of corrupt and cunning government agents, and a powerful cabal of Satanists. One of his last appearances is still on YouTube, a video shot on the evening of January 12, 2011. Gunderson is standing in the middle of a field in Los Angeles. Compared to the Ted Gunderson of the 1980s, this version looks gaunt and tired. He died of cancer seven months later. It looks like a nice night. The camera tilts up over his right shoulder into the sky. Condensation trails from jet engines over a hill against an orange sky. But they aren't ordinary condensation trails, Gunderson tells us. They're death dumps, poisonous chemicals being released into the atmosphere daily by the United Nations. He goes on. Birds are dying around the world. Fish are dying by the hundreds of thousands around the world. This is genocide. This is poison. This is murder by the United Nations. I personally have observed the planes that were standing still in Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska, at the Air National Guard. They have no markings on them. They're huge, bomber-like airplanes with no markings. Somebody has to do something about it. Chapter 43 E-323 and Q-89 A Freedom of Information Act, FOIA, or FOIA request had been filed, but it wasn't until 1983, the same year Fatal Vision was published, that suddenly hundreds of documents previously unknown to the defense were released. Many of them concerned the physical evidence collected by the CID and FBI. Hundreds of samples and thousands of hours of laboratory work involved in analyzing them. O'Neill hired Raymond Shedlick, a 20-year veteran of the New York City and Nassau County Police, who had retired to Durham, North Carolina. There were so many people who were caught up in the case, on both sides, but one of the most moving of the stories involves Ray Shedlick and his daughter, Ellen Danley, who joined her father as an investigator in the case. I asked Ellen Danley how they came to be involved. Ellen Danley. I was living in North Carolina, and then my parents decided to move down around 1982. My father was a New York City detective, and he worked for the district attorney of Nassau County. When he moved down here, he retired, and he got a call from one of his people he worked with, John O'Connell, in New York. He said he had a case down in North Carolina, and was wondering if my father wanted to take a look at it part-time. So my father started to look at the case, and it was the Jeffrey McDonald case. And he told John, there is no way this is a part-time kind of case. The reading material alone was overwhelming. So he eventually went on to the case full-time, and he needed somebody that could work for him, 
trust do the filing, because this was obviously going to be a very big issue. And that's when he hired me. And when he got hired, he told the attorneys, he told everyone, whatever I find, that's what it is. It's only the facts. So, how old were you when you became your father's assistant in this case? I would have been about 23, and he got licensed as a private investigator in North Carolina so he could interview people. Later on, when he got sick and died, I got my license so I could carry on his work. The case became so big, my father started to get all this material that included Ted Gunderson's material, which was about three black notebooks. And my father started to put together a timeline. We went back over and interviewed people and found new people. He read the CID reports. As many reports as we had, every piece he read and notes were made on it and we would type up everything. Everything was kept in files, cross-referenced, so it was a really good system we had going on. He put together a timeline. It was depressing to read about Colette and these kids and what happened to them over and over and over. But to my father, this was a job. It was just something he was going to do. I was probably a little bit more emotionally upset by this whole scenario than he was. To him, it was business as usual, I guess. And then my father got sick. He got cancer. What kind of cancer did he have? He had lung cancer. He smoked. He knew it was a death sentence, you know? That was it. We wanted to get every piece of FOIA paperwork we could get our hands on. So the lawyers sent away for every scrap of paper they could get, particularly the CID and FBI lab notes. The lab work was always of interest to me, and that was one area where we could just cross-reference it, go through it, put it together, and that's when I found the fibers. And that was absolutely the bombshell. Your father was still alive at this point? He was still alive. The government's whole case was that Jeffrey McDonald could not explain the purple fibers on the club, threads from the seams of his pajama top. Bernie Siegel, his first lawyer, had built his whole case on Helena Stokely. He had never done anything with the forensics, never questioned the government. Nothing. So, of course, when Judge Dupree threw out Helena Stokely, their whole case went out the window. But once we were given the technician's paperwork, the lab notes, for every exhibit recorded on that paper, if there were 100 exhibits on that paper, if it said D6, D7, E5, whatever it was, I would Xerox it that many times. Across the house, I'd have 120 piles, down the hall, through the bedrooms. But you had no access to the actual exhibits themselves, correct? No, no access to the exhibits. The only thing I had was the lab work from the FBI, their notes, the handwritten notes from the little scientist in the room. Everything that they had, and everything the CID had, anything in this case that had to do with any exhibit was put in a pile for that particular exhibit. Say it was Q10. Everything that had to do with Q10 in this case was in the pile called Q10. Then we put it all into date order. And now you start flipping the pages and seeing what was found in 72 or what was found in 90 or whenever this work was done. And of course, all the blood work was very suspicious. We knew something was wrong with it, but somebody else would have to handle that. But when we went through the paperwork, whoa, whoa, whoa. When you said you knew something was wrong with it, independent of the question of whether you have a degree in hematology or whatever, why did you think there was something wrong with it? I could see discrepancies. I could see where they would say it was B in one handwritten note, and then later on would say that it was A. So, go on. I'm sorry. When we started to go through the exhibits and we got to the crucial ones, lo and behold, in addition to purple fibers, they're describing black wool fibers black wool fibers in Colette's mouth on the club on her pajama top. In court, the government kept emphasizing the fibers that came from Jeffrey McDonald's pajamas, but there were additional fibers that were not revealed to the defense. The night that McDonald was, his family and he were attacked, he describes seeing Helena Stokely with the long blonde hair and wearing some black outfit, black wool skirt or whatever she said she wore. And, of course, Micah, the MP that night, going to the scene, sees a woman on the corner who they never picked up. What a shame. He told his superior there was a woman on the corner with long blonde hair and a floppy hat. So all of it fell into place. Bottom line is, they lied. And then there was the blonde hair. Going through the next exhibit, I can't remember the numbers, 
E323. But then they find these three blonde synthetic fibers, 22 to 24 inches long, in a hairbrush. The government said it came from a doll. You found the blonde wig fiber? Yes, yes I did, and the black fibers. I was in my kitchen when I found them, and I called my dad and told him, Dad, you've got to come here. You won't believe what I'm seeing. I think I'm crazy. Am I seeing what I'm seeing? And he came over, and he looked at the paperwork. He said, That's it. That's it. That's the case. And what year would this have been that you discovered? My father died in 89, so this would have been 88, 1988. And then from there, of course, we put together reports, submitted them to Alan Dershowitz and Harvey Silverglade, and they took the case, and that was it. That was the stuff they needed. Those two pieces right there, those two major findings. These two pieces of evidence were black wool fibers, unsourced to anything in the home, taken from Q89, a vial of material from the club, and the strands of saran, a synthetic fiber developed by the Dow Chemical Company, found in E323, Colette's hairbrush. Q89 and E323 reveal how two seemingly innocuous details can change our perception of a crime. First, from Q89, the wool fibers. Back on August 28, 1979, Blackburn was summing up to the jury. You could throw the whole shooting match away except for these two pieces of evidence. He brandished the club and the pajama top. The club had been found outside the back door of 544 Castle Drive with two little purple threads, stitching threads on it, matching McDonald's torn pajama top. Blackburn was asking a seemingly simple but misleading question. If McDonald had entered the bedroom and found Colette after the assailants had left the house, how was it that fibers from his torn pajama top were found outside on the club? As Blackburn described it for the jury, This sounds sort of minor, really, until you think about something. How did they get there? If the pajama top was not taken off of his body in the hall or the living room until this club was out the door, how in the name of all that is reasonable did they walk out the door and get on the club and stick to it? Indeed. In the name of all that is reasonable, Blackburn proposed to the jury that the only way the pajama top fibers could have gotten on the club was in the master bedroom. Not so. They could have gotten on the club when McDonald was attacked in the living room. Blue pajama top fibers had been found in the hallway in the place where McDonald had been knocked unconscious. But Danley's discovery wasn't about cotton fibers. There were two kinds of threads on the club. Purple cotton and black wool. The black wool unsourced to anything in the house. Danley had discovered a crucial piece of evidence that had never been presented to the jury. And unlike the purple cotton, its presence on the club could not easily be explained. Plus, other black woolen fibers had been found at the crime scene that were similar to the black woolen fibers on the club. They were found inside Colette McDonald's mouth. So, your father believed he was innocent? In the beginning, my father's feeling was, I'm law enforcement, so I tend to lean a little bit towards thinking that they're in the right but I remember him reading this stuff and shaking his head. He couldn't believe it. It was sloppy, sloppy work. That's what he always said. MPs tramping through a crime scene and all the other stuff, he became convinced that this guy was innocent. Certainly deserved a new trial. I don't know if he'll ever get out, but at least give the man a fair trial. Bring all of this stuff out, and then wherever the chips fall, they fall. Do you feel the government went out of its way to make... They knew darn well that the threads weren't all purple. They had the notes, the same notes that I was looking at, so they picked and chose what they wanted to use because in their minds, they figured he's guilty, right or wrong. So they select the evidence that, Oh yes, I'm definitely convinced of that, and I know my father was convinced of that. How could you not? You've got your own lab people. Your people are telling you this is black wool. Who made the decision to suppress that evidence? And were they ever matched to anything else in the home? No, they were never matched. 
and you have the blonde hair along with everything else. Do you remember when you became convinced he was innocent? It was really an accumulation. It took a long time. I've never been a big Jeff fan, I'll tell you that right up front. I've butted heads with him a lot of times. How so? Explain this to me. Well, you know, I was very sensitive about the evidence that we did find and my father's work. Well, Jeff is in jail, and Jeff will crawl over your back to get out. If you're not moving fast enough for him, he would send somebody else over to knock on your door to get you to. He wanted out of there. He wanted to be vindicated. I don't blame him for that, but I was very sensitive at the time, so I would get very nervous. As you will see through the case, a lot of people have claimed credit for my work or my father's work. Gunderson was going to make a movie. I think he was given a $50,000 check based on what we found on these black wool fibers and blonde hair. I called out to California and spoke to the lawyer, Brian O'Neill, about it. And then I finally had somebody call the TV station that he was working with. And, of course, he had to give back the check and the whole thing ended. He never found anything. I was very, very sensitive to a lot of things. They went over our witnesses, they re-interviewed them, and the next thing you know, they're getting better and better. You ruin the credibility of your witnesses when you do that, you know? This must have been terribly frustrating, the fact that your father was dying, and he still couldn't crack this case. It was sad. I would say he was saddened by it. He'd say, no matter if I brought Colette before the court, the door is shut, it won't open, they won't concede. Yes, I guess it was frustrating. And this was the last-ditch effort. But at the end of the day, my father was the kind of person that he shut the door and he had his own family to concern himself about. He couldn't save the world. He wrote a very nice letter for Jeff when he went before the parole board. He knew it would be after he was dead. He said, These are not killing hands. These are the hands of a healer.